The first thing people usually ask me when I tell them I've written a book on the biology of ageing and how we could soon have medicines to treat it isn't usually to do with biology, medicine, or even health advice. It's, whoa, wouldn't that cause massive overpopulation? Ageing is the world's single largest cause of death. So if we treated it, wouldn't people stop dying in huge numbers and cause a population disaster? We're already pushing up against environmental limits for carbon dioxide emissions, deforestation, air and water pollution, and much more. And more people are going to cause more of all of those things. So I wanted to explain why this isn't as worrying as it might sound at first, and why there are far more important things to go after than ageing biology if you want to save the planet. So would treating ageing cause overpopulation? Well, I'd actually like to start with the word overpopulation. The first issue is that this is a really bad description of the problem, and I'd like to explain why it's actually a bit racist too. Overpopulation implies that the problem is the people, rather than the resources we use. And obviously it's not the people themselves, but the food we eat, the fuel we burn, and the stuff we buy, which is straining the planet. And resource use is massively unevenly distributed, with those of us in rich countries using far, far more than people in the poorer parts of the world. Let's take the example of carbon dioxide. If we split the world up into 10 groups based on how much they earn, then the richest 10% are responsible for almost 50% of the CO2 emissions, while the poorest 50% are responsible for less than 10% of CO2. If we literally killed the poorest 50% of people on the planet, and bear with me here, but I'm not sure that's the greatest idea, then even that would barely make a dent in global CO2 emissions. The reason calling it overpopulation isn't just a bit misleading, but actively racist, is because it's the poorest 50% of the world whose population is growing most quickly, thanks to higher birth rates in poorer countries, who, as we've just seen, barely emit any carbon dioxide. In the poor countries of sub-Saharan Africa, the fertility rate is an average of 4.6 children per woman, while the EU has a fertility rate of just 1.5, which means, but for immigration, the population of Europe is shrinking. So blaming climate change on population growth is blaming exactly the wrong people. Mainly black and brown people who live in poorer countries. Other measures of resource use tell a similar story. When it comes to use of land, the average Ugandan needs an area of about 0.4 hectares to grow the food they eat, while the average American diet requires over four times as much, both because they eat more food and because much more of it's meat. The total habitable land area of the planet is just 1.4 hectares per person, meaning it would be literally impossible for all of us to adopt the American diet as it is today. Even if we raised every forest to the ground and converted every last bit of farmable scrub to fields, we still wouldn't have enough space to support an American diet with current agricultural practices. And this is what makes it especially clear that resources, not people, are the problem. If we want to bring everyone in poorer countries up to a Western standard of living, then using current technology, agriculture, and levels of consumption, we literally can't do that. There's just not enough land. We totally trash the climate with an incredible amount of CO2, and so on. In order to give everyone a rich world quality of life, and I'd argue that should be our aspiration, we need to come up with a way to provide that that has a far smaller footprint on the planet. And we need to do it soon. For example, we need to get down to net zero carbon emissions over the next few decades, or we're going to be in really big climate trouble. And then, the good news about net zero is, zero emissions per person, multiplied by any number of people, is still zero carbon dioxide overall. This is obviously an oversimplification, but it shows us why we need to solve this primarily using technological and social change, which have the ability to reduce them to zero over a few decades, rather than via trying to control population which could only take emissions to zero if we, well, killed everyone. So, given that something like half the world's people are barely contributing to the issue, and we want to improve their lives, this is very much a problem that we need to solve anyway, whatever happens with ageing biology. Even still, it's inarguable that solving climate change and other environmental issues would be easier with fewer people. But I think the most surprising fact about treating ageing is just how little difference it would actually make to global population. This is what the population of the world has looked like over the last couple of decades, crossing the 6 billion line in 1999, 7 billion people in 2011, and it's very nearly 8 billion today. 
So what's going to happen in future? Well, let's take a look at the best guess from the population geeks at the United Nations, their so-called medium variant. Given their assumptions about birth rates and life expectancy, this shows the population rising to about 9.7 billion people by 2050. Let's make a completely ridiculous assumption. Let's assume that we can entirely cure ageing by 2025. At the moment, a human's risk of death doubles about every eight years because of ageing. So if we cured ageing, your risk of death would stay constant, no matter how long ago you were born. People would still die. There'd still be buses to be hit by, infectious disease, and the much smaller chance of getting something like cancer or diabetes, as is experienced by a young adult today. But there'd be far less illness and death, and people wouldn't deteriorate as they got older. I entirely believe this is what we should be aiming for with medical research, but achieving this in just a few years' time is obviously ludicrous. Not only is it an impossible timescale scientifically, it also assumes that we can roll out any treatments we devise instantaneously to everyone on Earth. But it does provide us with what a population pessimist would see as a worst-case scenario, because everyone would entirely stop dying of old age in just a few years' time. In this worst case, the population in 2050 would be 11.3 billion. Is that a lot? Well, it is and it isn't. One and a half billion does sound like a lot of extra mouths to feed, but it makes more sense to think of it as a percentage, and the percentage increase is about 16%. And I'd happily work 16% harder to solve our environmental problems if it meant near eradication of terrible diseases like cancer and dementia, and reduce suffering into old age for billions of people. And let's not forget, this is a wild extreme case. In the relatively likely event that we somehow fail to cure ageing by 2025, we're likely to only need to work maybe 5 or 10% harder on climate change, which doesn't seem like an enormous imposition if people get to live longer, healthier lives as a result. And there's a decent chance that things might even be less problematic than that, because this analysis neglects the other arguably larger driver of population growth – birth rates. The UN also has a high and a low variant, which differ from the medium only by changing birth rates, and the difference between them in 2050 is 20%, which means that reasonable uncertainty about the number of children that we'll have in the future has a larger effect on population size than people totally stopping dying from old age, which, with apologies, I'll remind everyone again, is quite an extreme scenario. In fact, depending on their assumptions about future birth rates, Serious demographers are worried about an underpopulation crisis, with too few people of working age to support the growing number of older people. In the best case scenario, perhaps treatments for ageing will extend our healthy lives just in time to save us from underpopulation. Or at the very least, it shows us that what's going to happen to the population in future is very hard to predict, and how long we live plays a surprisingly small role. There are two other points it's probably worth making here. Firstly, the trend in the past has been for increasing life expectancy to go hand in hand with reduced birth rates, and people having kids later. So it's quite possible that treating ageing, especially if it delays women's reproductive ageing, will allow women to have children later still, and continue or even accelerate this trend, which would obviously reduce its effect on population growth. As an added bonus, delaying female reproductive ageing could compound with existing trends in educating and empowering women to give them more reproductive freedom. I don't think it's hard to argue that treating ageing is actually a feminist issue. Second, it's thoroughly bizarre how little interest demographers seem to take in what's going to happen to lifespans in the future. This chart shows how life expectancy is projected to change in the rich world by the other major provider of population forecasts, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. And, as you can see, they think that life expectancy will increase more slowly in the future than it has in the past without really giving any evidence for why this should be. They also think that different countries will plateau at different levels, which seems very strange. According to their projections, the US can't catch up with life expectancy leaders Japan, even by 2100. And the meteoric rise of life expectancy in a poorer country, like Nigeria, will not only slow down, but actually plateau before it reaches levels which we already know are possible, because people in rich countries today are already living that long. Just why? Even if we don't develop medicines for ageing, this seems pretty likely to be wrong. And if we do, it could be wildly wrong. If any demographers are watching, please take significant progress in ageing biology over the next 100 years more seriously. 
This science is coming fast, and we really need some proper models to understand how this is going to affect the population, the economy, the climate, and much more besides. So, in summary, there are plenty of reasons to think that treating ageing would turn out to be a smaller problem than it sounds at first. Though more serious modelling is clearly needed to do a better job than my scenario, where we just cancel all age-related death in a few years' time. The next thing is it's also really important to remember what's on the other side of the balance sheet here. On the one hand, we've got an uncertain and probably relatively small population increase, which will mildly exacerbate a problem we're desperately going to need to solve anyway. And on the other, we have treatments for the world's greatest cause of death and suffering. In fact, ageing is responsible for over two-thirds of deaths around the world, and costs the global economy trillions of dollars every year. And those figures are only increasing as the global population ages. I think when discussing ethical objections to treating ageing, it's often helpful to reverse the question. To imagine we lived in a world where ageing didn't exist, but one of these other problems did. As we discussed before, even without ageing, people can still die. But in our hypothetical world, people are living far, far longer in good health than they are today. Imagine there was also a population crisis, 20 billion people on the earth, an environmental catastrophe. Would you invent ageing to solve this problem? I don't think you would. I think you'd do everything you could to cut back carbon footprints, change diets and lifestyles, generate energy in cleaner ways, and so on. And if all that didn't work, as an absolutely last resort, you decided literally the only way to deal with this was to kill people, you surely wouldn't do so with a decades-long process of disease and decay. Would you let people watch their friends and family slowly have their independence stolen from them and create a huge economic burden of caring for all these newly ageing people? Death from ageing is a cruel way to go, and I think you could come up with something far less barbaric to solve, well, basically any problem, including one of population. Given that the answer is so clear when the question is presented this way around, I think the reverse situation of course, the one we actually find ourselves in, has an equally clear answer. Stopping medical research should be absolutely the last thing we do to try to save the environment. And when you put it like that, the case is even clearer. After all, medicines for ageing are just medicines. No one would ask a cancer researcher whether they were worried that their incredible new immunotherapy might result in overpopulation, even though treatments for both ageing and cancer are designed to do the same thing – extend people's healthy lives. So why do we place ageing research in a totally separate moral category? And arguing to limit ageing research to save the environment is like arguing to keep poor people poor to save the environment. Firstly, it's just not okay. We can't allow suffering to continue to avert a smaller amount of suffering. And secondly, it probably wouldn't work, because neither the poor people who aren't emitting any carbon dioxide, nor a relatively small number of additional healthy older people, make a big enough contribution to climate change to make or break our efforts. And finally, it's just a false dichotomy. We can and should aim to reduce poverty, fight ageing, and clean up the planet, all at the same time. There are also a few possible counterpoints, which I think are often neglected due to our tendency to focus on the negative. Some of the side effects of curing ageing could improve our world, rather than wrecking it. The first idea is that as we live longer lives, we might create a more thoughtful, far-sighted society, more able to tackle long-term issues like climate change, not least because more of us will live long enough to see its worst consequences. And just to prove I'm not a mindless anti-aging fanboy, this is actually one argument I'm pretty sceptical of. We humans seem to mainly plan over periods much shorter than our current lifespans, let alone extended ones, and some of that is driven by the systems we've invented, rather than by us as individuals. From companies making annual payouts to shareholders, to five-year terms of political office, our society often incentivises short-term profits or popularity over planning for the future. And I'm not sure even a cure for ageing could cure our lack of foresight and fix our institutions. I'm sorry to report that science and medicine can't magically solve all of our problems. However, in fairness to this idea, longer lifespans surely can't make this problem worse. And I'd love to be proven wrong and for humanity to become wiser and more deliberative with our extra years on the planet. I think a stronger argument is that a larger population, due to medicines that can delay ageing, could well be a good thing in and of itself. The first part of this is economic, because ageing is really expensive, what with paying for medicines and doctors and nurses, and the enormous cost of care for elderly people, plus the indirect cost of people becoming too ill to work thanks to age-related diseases. 
treating ageing could actually free up large amounts of money that we could use to tackle all kinds of issues, including climate change. And there are direct benefits to a larger population that we all too often ignore. More people means more opportunities for happiness. More great artists and musicians, writers and scientists. And, of course, more people to enjoy their amazing works or benefit from their technological breakthroughs. It's even possible that some 85-year-old scientist who would otherwise have been struck down by heart disease or dementia will make a specific breakthrough that'll help the environment. Perhaps even a breakthrough that would have been difficult or impossible without slightly longer than current human lifespans to achieve the relevant mastery of their field. There's a whole school of philosophy called population ethics that tries to make sense of morality in terms of things like how many people exist and their well-being and so on. And I won't be delving into its fascinating and complicated depths here. But it's pretty intuitive to imagine that more people living happy lives for longer, perhaps even happier lives because they're healthy, their loved ones and their friends are healthy too, and so on, is a good thing just in and of itself. So the negative consequences of treating ageing on population and the environment are less severe than they intuitively seem. The idea of treating or even curing ageing seems so radical that I think we're wired to focus on the negative potential impacts. But in doing so, we often miss the positives, including the most obvious one. Just how precious every human life is. <laughs>